The average Australian garage is 3.4 metres by 5.8 metres, which sounds great and big, except for when you have to share it with the car, the boat, the kids, and anything else you can put in there. How are you supposed to get anything done? Welcome everybody. Hello everybody, how are you? Welcome to the Tiny Workshop. I'm John Madden. I'm Patrick Holcomb. How are you Patrick? I'm doing okay. What a week, it's like I woke up and it's, what is it, Thursday? I know, it's already over. The, the, uh, the long weekend is thrown. What, what do you think of my um, apron? A little bit jealous, quite like it. Um, don't have one myself. I don't know whether I like the apron. It's kind of like younger guys with the hips of woodwork. Wear their outfits on their. Now, I feel like an old man, but I suppose I am now. So. I think you either need more grey hair or more tattoos, one or the other. No, I'm not into tattoos. But I think the thing is, of course, you, you probably realise now that I only own two shirts per year. Mm. This helps protect it because mm. my wife's getting upset. Yeah. Anyway, that's another story. Okay, so what we're going to complete our tool cabinet tonight. Um, it, and we were having this conversation about clutter last week. Why is it great to reduce clutter? Look, if you've got stuff laying all around your workshop, it makes you less productive. And so if you didn't catch last week, we're building a really simple tool trolley that you can put all kinds of stuff on, super useful. We've just got to finish it off today. And mm. then we're also making some accessories that go onto that to help you put stuff in. Yeah, we're going to make a bunch of accessories. I think Jake is with us and he's going to take us through using a biscuit joiner because he kindly made something for us. And also, you're doing your first tiny tip. Patrick. Yeah, I got roped into tiny tips. Yeah. I'm uh, demonstrating how to use a circular saw really effectively to get nice, clean, straight cuts yeah, okay. like a panel saw. Yeah, okay. So you can break down larger sheets of material in your workshop at home. You won't want to miss any of this. And while we're here, remember to subscribe to the channel. And I believe you've got to ring the little bell. Hit there. the notification button. Okay, so let's have a let's have a brief look. You're going to get stuck into this? Yes, I am. Yeah, okay. Why don't, I'm going to start unscrewing the screws. I've done a few already to speed things up. But um, I'm going to start unscrewing doing, and doing the dowel element. Oh, yep. And you're doing sanding, I believe. Yeah, so I've got this panel that we actually glued up last week. And I have to do two things. I have to clean up any glue and give it a sand. And, but first, I want to actually trim it down to size. So we made it slightly oversized. I've already removed the bulk of the material that I need to, and I just want to take a fraction off the end to get it exactly down to the right size. There are a couple of ways of doing this. If you have a uh, panel saw or a table saw, you can use that to get a nice clean edge. If you want, you can use the circular saw technique, which I am gonna demonstrate later in this episode. But what I'm gonna show you how to do it is with a trimming router. So, first of all, you're gonna to wanna to mark the exact line that you wanna cut on your board. So I've already measured this. I know that that little gray lead line, which is probably not very visible to you guys, is where I wanna cut. Then you're gonna need a straight edge. I'm just using this piece of plywood, and I know that it's straight, because I cut it earlier. You're going to place that on that line. And you'll want to clamp that down. Don't mind me. Do you normally use a piece of plywood? I guess a piece of plywood is a good way to make a straight edge. Because the plywood's going to keep its integrity, so to speak. It'll stay straight, as opposed to a piece of wood, which can move around a lot. If you're going to make a, a straight edge for, the sh for your workshop out of found materials, plywood, and I reckon aluminium, I always have a great straight edge yeah, made out of aluminium absolutely. that I've bought at a hardware yeah, shop. Yeah, you want something that's not going to bend with moisture. So, that is going to be the straight edge that my bearing is going to run along. I'm going to flip it over and I'm actually going to do the routing from the top side. So, this is my trimming router. The bit I'm using is a flush trimming bit that has a blade and a bearing. Now the bearing needs to run along a guide, that's what my plywood is for, while the blade is going to cut off excess material. 
These do a great job. They make a really nice clean cut. However, you don't want to be removing too much material with them, which is why I've already removed the bulk of the material with a circular saw earlier. So I'm only removing about a millimeter or less with this trimming router. One more thing to consider. As you push through the end of the timber, if you hit those fibers at the very end, you can tear them out. So I'm gonna to touch the end backwards first to clean that up, make sure I don't get any tear out, and then I'll come and do the whole thing as one pass after that. If you do have to remove more than one millimeter of material, do it in a couple of passes and creep up to it. I'm gonna get stuck into that. Um, while I'm making a whole bunch of noise. I've misplaced my dowel. Is that my dowel you're using, Nick, to point at things? No. <laughs> um, please continue on while I search it out. Yeah? All right. Well, I'm going to do these cuts. I was just thinking to myself, we could work out some way to do sign language so someone can speak while you're machining, yeah? Yeah, that's right. Um, I found a piece of dowel, it was over there. What I'm doing is I've drilled out these holes using a, um, a 9 bill bit, I think it was, and I drive these and cut them off. But we'll come back to this once you've got your thing o sorted. Okay. All right, so I'm just going to take this off the clamps. I don't need that guide on the This uh, screw and dowel technique's really been pushing this pine timber to the edge of its capabilities. I found that when I was drill, drilling out, we were getting a bit of tear out and stuff on the material, but we'll talk about that a bit later sure. when you've got time. Yeah? So that trimming bit has given me a nice clean edge. This little burn line that you can see it was actually because I've used and abused this particular trimming bit quite a lot, so there was a slight imperfection or a bluntness on the blade. With a nice clean blade or a new one, I wouldn't be getting that, but if you're curious about that line, that's what that is. The next thing I'm going to be doing is getting to sanding this. I have already sanded one side and I've left one side to demonstrate. You'll notice that there's a bit of glue on here that I want to remove. And there's also, you probably can't see this, but there's this board here is slightly higher than the one there. And I could sand that, but I'm actually going to use a scraper to clean that up first. Now, if you don't know what a scraper is, it's a really inexpensive and fantastic tool. It's a little thin bendy piece of metal that you can create a burr on the edge of, and you can use it to remove material in a really controlled manner. You could also do this with a plane, but a scraper is a lot less expensive. And I find that doing this first will be quicker than just sanding the entire thing. It's, it's really great too, if you, for scrapers, if you have to clean up an isolated spot. So if you've got a little tiny knot or something you want to work around, get a scraper in there and you can clean up and then feather that into the rest of the surface. So Absolutely. Really hard to sharpen. Well, some people find them hard to sharpen though. Yeah, I, I mean, we, look, to get into the detail of, of sharpening and maintaining a scraper does require some uh, technique, but I just thought I'd show you now because it's uh, you know, a pretty handy little tool. Time, yeah. I think the secret to scraper sharpening is not too much pressure. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> So I'm getting actual 
um, shavings off the edge of this piece of material, off the edge of this metal. This is what you want to be seeing off a scraper. Actual shavings, not just powder. And that's why it's such an effective tool for removing material. I'll just spend another couple seconds on this and then I'll grab the sander. How are you going, John? Yeah, that's the last of the dowels. Um, I think I've got them all, but that's not important. Some of them are listed. I haven't used the flush saw tonight. I've used the Japanese Suzuki. Um, I did have an option, but I just wanted to watch out. Sometimes when you cut a dowel off, you'll get a little high point on the uh, on the end of the dowel that's above the surface. If you cut it too low, like I've done there, you tend to mar the surface. So all we can do to repair that is just take a sharp chisel and just pare back that dowel, or we can use a block plane. So I'll give this up to the bench and start to do that. Alrighty, so I'm going to grab my random orbital sander out and I'm going to finish cleaning this up and I think while I do that we're actually going to send over to Jake to get him to Yeah, that's a good point. Now, Jake's doing a little tiny, was it no, Jake's machinery hacks on the biscuit joint and I think it's a classic tool that everyone should get eventually in their kit. Um, so, come back after the break. Just before we do, I'm, just, I'm going to be using a Oh, there it is, a random orbital sander. I love these machines over a belt sander. I think it's a really easy way to get a very consistent finish. Mm -hmm. They're a powerful tool and it was one of this, not this particular one, but my random orbital what sander. There's nothing wrong with that one. That's a festival, it's mine. Fantastic it's like... tool. But my, my random orbital was one of the first tools I bought and I have used it for years. So mm -hmm. buy a good quality one. Yeah. And it's so much more versatile than uh, another type of sander, I reckon. Yeah, yeah. No, get a quality one. That's important. Yeah. Anyway, we'll see you after the break. Hey, guys. I'm Jake. Uh, and we're back for another Machinery Hacks. So the blokes in Tiny Workshop today asked me to get a plinth together uh, for their show, uh, or their upcoming episode. Uh, I thought it would be a good opportunity to talk to you guys about biscuit cutters uh, and the utility of this handy little machine. Essentially, the basics that you need for biscuit cutting are obviously your material, biscuit cutter itself, some glue and some biscuits. Biscuits come in all different sizes, mostly from they grade it from 0 to 10 to 20. They're primarily used to keep boards flat against each other so that there's no twisting uh, they're very similar to dowels in that they will aid in the leveling of your timber. But they don't really add much structural strength to it. So first, I'm just gonna quickly measure out. Um, all you essentially want to do is make sure that when you're joining a plinth like this that you keep the biscuit as close to center as possible. When a biscuit cutter is cutting a slot, it cuts it much wider, maybe 10 or so mil wider than the biscuit that you're putting into it. So just keep that in mind uh, when you are cutting material for it. Marking out, uh, unless you are gluing boards together, not really important, just try and keep it central. Uh, I like to, if I've got quite a few pieces, I like to leave you know, A or B or C, one, two, three, just do shapes if you prefer, whatever helps you uh, line your pieces up after you've cut them. And other than that, just make sure that you keep your hands out of the way and you keep your timber secured, and that's about it. So let's get started. So basically, with a biscuit cutter, you have the height adjustment, you have the angle adjustment. You would normally keep it at, say, a 90 degree angle when you're doing flat, uh, flat boards. Uh, make sure, as with all machinery, you have sufficient dust extraction because the amount of dust coming out of these is quite large. Let's get started. So the one thing that I've seen a lot of guys have issues with with the biscuit cutter is that it tends to tilt. You want to do your absolute best to try and keep the top lip as flat on the material as possible. Uh, that should avoid any kind of you know, tilting which will take your material out of line. 
So we've got our slots cut, now it's time to glue up. Uh, very, very simple operation, as I'm sure everybody who's used dowel before, try not to overfill your holes. Probably just slide just a little bit along the joint itself because again, the biscuit is only providing level, it's not providing strength. It's the glue that's um, providing the strength. At the end of the day, I'm not sure how familiar you are with these, but they are essentially a saw blade spinning at a very high speed uh, on the end of a on, a on the end of a push. So make sure when you are operating it, you keep your hands as far away from the sides. What tends to happen is that the blade goes in, uh, catches, and then drags out. You want to make sure your hands are as far away from that action as possible. Uh, and that's it for another video, so I hopefully you get something out of this and we'll return you now to your regularly scheduled program. Okay. All right, everybody, welcome back. Um, we are about ready to assemble this and I'm gonna go through all of the components, but first, don't forget to subscribe to the channel and hit the notification button. Ring the bell so you get updates when we release a new video to the tiny workshop. All right, what have, we got? what have we got here? You've got the carcass. Here it is. Now, we have shelves for this, as well as the top. So we have one shelf bit that we glued together last time. The top that I just cleaned up with my sander. Hmm. John sander. John sander. John's my lovely I've had that like 15 years, that tool. Oh, that's so, good. Yeah. That's, yeah, buy a good tool once, and it'll last you a long well, time. Yeah, exactly. Um, this component is what the wheels are going to mount on, and then that will screw on the underside. Thank you, Jake, for making that. Those are all of the pieces that go together to make this object. So while you're finishing that off, yep. I'm going to attach the wheels to this frame here. And then we will attach the shelves in there. How are you going to attach the shelves? What I've made up is a little set of battens, just sort of 19 by 19 mil. And I think we, it's similar to the how we screwed down the top of the bench. You're going to screw this little batten, it's pre-drilled obviously, speed things up, um, to the inside of the rails on the shelf and the under top of the rail, and then we can screw up through that into the two shelf top elements to hold them in place. Excellent. Um, you get a bit of movement in a cabinet like this, but it's not going to be enough to up, you know, to, for the top to delaminate or anything. Sure. So I'll get on with that. Cool. But I did, while we're doing a little bit of work here, I want to talk about the timber we've been using. Um, I mentioned earlier, when I was drilling some of the holes out for the dowels, I was getting a fair amount of tear out. And I think that, oh, that's very loud. The, um, the problem was we, we don't have, we're not playing with a lot of material here. And because the pine's got quite a coarse grain, I, I mean, you can't really see it on camera, but I'm not happy about using pine. Yeah. Haig's not happy about us using pine. He says to me the other day, when are you going to start making some you know, real things? So these are real things, yeah. but you know. Yeah, I mean, it's obviously, when you're building furniture for your workshop, it's fine mm. to be using plywood and pine, but we want to be showing you nicer um, techniques with nicer materials. So we will start moving on to... Well, using better quality timber allows you to push what you're making further. So we're going to make a change soon. We're going to start using hardwood, yep. so to speak. But that means that we need to start to be able to dimension the materials that we're using so we're going to introduce, we're going to go shopping and buy ourselves a couple of little machines. Now I don't know if we should tell them now what we get. I thought an Altendorf would be nice and maybe like... That would fit just here. Yeah, yeah, sort of, yeah. Um, so stay tuned for the next episode. We're going to get on to... A, we're going to introduce a couple of machines and start to play with hardwood. But anyway, we better go with some work here. Now, yeah? this is going to be noisy, so you'll just have to watch what we're doing and enjoy the, enjoy the noise. That, that's a very noisy screw gun. Yeah, it is. It's very effective. Glasses. I think I've already split the timber. <laughs> well, yeah. Hence, hence the conversation about using pine. Though it's convenient and it's a good place to start 
but unfortunately, it doesn't have the integrity you need to, I mean, it does have integrity, don't get me wrong, but it's not the same as using a quality furniture grade timber, so to speak. Do you have a little um, drill that I can use? To... Yeah, it's just on the... Pre-drill these. Up there. Perfect. On our little magnetised rack available from TimberCon, yeah? But you can buy those things anywhere, I guess. But, you know, the ones we have here are just extra sticky. Okay. Can't really see. Can you, Sheldon, do you want to come in here and have a look at this too? I'm just screwing down. Just so you can fix it out. Just below the surface. Just below the surface. So um, when you pull down, the, the piece of material pulls flush to the top of the, the rail. So, yeah. Excellent. I'll turn this over. So how's your dog Whittaker going? We should oh. get Whittaker on the show. I don't think he'd be very useful. <laughs> no. He looks cute. I'm in charge of the cute department. Okay. Right, one more. I shouldn't have even attempted this without pre-drilling. I don't know what I was thinking. I'm just oh. getting lazy. Well, you know, like we said at the start of the program, this has been a hell of a week. And uh, it snuck up very quickly because there's an awful lot of preparation goes into this program. If you want to have a quick look at this, Shelton, up close, these little um, snappy drills, I think they're called, yeah. um, they come with a countersink attachment and they have a hex fitting which means you can pull them in and out of a driver really quickly and easily so for a job like this when i'm swapping between bits something like this is just perfect and it's worth getting a set of them for the countersink function alone but yeah i, I love them i have a whole bunch of them in my in my toolkit they are american product yeah yeah okay we're nearly done here I'm not really marking this out, I just eyeball it. Once the, the shelf support goes into place, you can't see it anyway. And as long as it's centered, that's the main thing. And don't drill right through the side of the timber either with the screw, which is always good. I'll come over the top. Oh, drop that one. Okay. Should have the cricket on or something while we're doing this. Yeah, that's right. These moments of comfortable S silence. Some nice classical music. Yeah. I, don't know, I, don't, I know people who like to listen to classical music when they do woodwork. I've always liked the like, electronic stuff, like Chicago House, something with a beat, you know, as yep. loud as possible. But anyway, that's just me. Okay, I'm good. How are you going? Two minutes less. Okay, twenty so seconds. Well, Patrick. Cleans that up a bit. I'll just wipe that little bit of excess glue that's come through. And hopefully the shelf, is this the shelf? Yes. That is the shelf. The shelf will hopefully fit. Might be a little tight. Oh, we'll find out very quickly. Oh, look at that. Perfect. I feel like I'm in Ikea or something. So yeah? good. Hey? Um, our design means that the all the components are up flush. But because we're going to screw back on this, let's one, let's wait one edge. So I'm going to just mark a apron handy, very handy. We'll put an F on there for the front. So everything else will be flush at the back because it's a little bit wider. Okay. Right. Screw gun. The one component that I forgot to mention before Ooh. was the back. And we'll be needing that. You saw me cutting that in the tiny tips. So this is just six mil, oh no, nine no, mil. I don't MD. think you've had your tiny tip, have you? Oh. No, that's coming up okay, next. Okay, so this well, piece of lovely square rectangle but perfectly cut MDF, I'm gonna demonstrate how to cut that. Okay, I think what we should do is go to a break because we're running terribly behind here. Um, we'll keep putting this together. We'll keep putting the cabinet together. 
Come back after break, we'll have this together, we'll put the back on, and then we're gonna get on to making some accessories. Sounds great. Okay, see you after the break. Hey, I'm Patrick. Welcome to another The Tiny Workshop Tiny Tips segment. If you wanna cut a really nice straight line in a piece of MDF or ply, there's a better way than just trying to eyeball that line and stay really close to it. You want to create some kind of straight edge to run your saw along. And the best way that I've found is to make yourself a really simple track like this. So all that this involves is gluing a guide piece of plywood onto another piece of plywood. And then you use your actual saw to cut along that edge to make sure that you've got the perfect distance between the guide and the edge of the blade. What this means is that you can put this edge directly on the line that you've drawn where you want the saw to go and you know that's where the blade will go because the blade was the one that cut that edge. So you want to try and run this in one smooth pass which means in my case I'm going to do this kneeling on top of the board because I can't do it smoothly the other way. If you have to stop in the centre it is difficult to restart without the saw biting and jumping backwards. If you absolutely do have to do it, make sure you've pulled back from the edge of the cut before you start the saw up again, but I really wouldn't recommend it. Try and do it in one pass. I'm gonna clamp this down and I'm gonna make this cut. Make sure your saw blade isn't set so that it's running too deep below the material that you're cutting. Be aware of what's underneath there because you will be cutting through this and make sure it's all supported so it doesn't fall away when you've finished your cut. I'm gonna clamp this down and make this cut. You can see how simple this is and it's really easy to make yourself one of those tracks. Mine's a bit beat up, I've used it for years. It's uh, just so handy. When you need to cut smaller pieces, it's a lot easier to do it on a flat bench that you don't care about rather than on horses because smaller pieces tend to fall through the cracks. But otherwise, make yourself a track, go nuts, get nice clean cuts. Okay, welcome back to the Tiny Workshop. I'm John Madden. I'm Patrick, still. Remember to subscribe. Okay, so, we're a bit flustered because, you know, there's everything's going on here at the same time. We're actually screwing the back on now. And the nice thing about putting it back on a cabinet is that it squares the whole thing up. So, we'll, we'll fix one side. We'll fix one side and then we will push the other side into place and screw that off. Do you want to... I'll come around the front here and... Should we rotate it? Are we okay to do that? No, we're going to have to lift up a little, I think, unfortunately. Okay. Oh! Lucky it's a Makita. <laughs> Alright. Okay. Glasses, come back. Okay. Oh. Why, why don't we um, pre-drill that? I'll just push that into shape. Making mine up, guys. <laughs> Alrighty. Okay, we'll finish this off. I like your, your, your spacing out technique. Okay. Turns out that assembling this thing took us more time than you anticipated. Oh. Do you want to talk about accessories while I finish this off? Okay. Well, we don't have much to do, but we will talk about accessories a little bit. What we're going to do here is that we overhung the back here by so much. And so I'm going to make a rack that a pipe lap rack can fit into. You know, pipe clamps. Yep. And I believe you're making, what is it? I heard it's a... A tool caddy. A tool caddy. To oh. uh, hang on the end, going to put a bunch of tools in there and stuff. I think it's like, I prefer the word tool saddle bag somehow, but we're not living in the high country at the moment, so um, we will stick with the word caddy. This is looking okay. Let's get that out of the way. And then we will stand this piece up. Maybe we should put it over there. Sure. What do you think? Do you want it on their horses? I think on the horses because 
it's uh, a little bit high. And this is the nice thing about... Oh, do you want to show the back since you're working on the back? Oh, I'm not going to work there yet. Okay. That's okay. Just put the sc screw this wheel set on. Yep. Okay. I think it's too high. <laughs> all right. We can just pin that no, there. It's all right. Yeah. It's all right. I'll do one too. How are you going to space that? Oh, uh, yeah, just right. Just put one and one. Yeah. Running out of battery. There we go. Now, if, if, if we were being more professional, we'd probably mark all that out. I would remind everybody that no one's ever going to see that. It's tucked up underneath. Should and, we um, flip it over? Let's flip it over. Which way do you want to go? That way? Go forward. Yep. And we can... <laughs> Remember that thing? Um, I'm, I'm, here, I'm, I'm here for the orgy, so where do I park my, uh, my, my cabinet? Yeah. <laughs> But um, here we go, we have a little mobile tool cabinet. What do you reckon? I think it's fantastic. I think what we should do, considering the time, let's just focus on what you're doing with the little tool caddy. Okay, sure. And we'll do the, I was going to um, go through a rather cool little pipe clamp that we did, but we might do that as a tiny tip or something another time. Sure. Okay, this simple little caddy is gonna hang on the side of our rolling tool rack on a French cleat, which we discussed in the first episode. It's got a little tray. All of this has just been glued and screwed together. I cut it all using the circular saw and a guide like I demonstrated in that technique. Mm. And at the top, I'm using some webbing, which is cheap and commonly available, mm. to make some little loops that you can hang tools in. Now, I've marked out some even spacing so that it looks relatively neat. Looks good. On both the webbing and on my piece of plywood here. And I have um, tested the, the rough spacing that I've already mapped out to make sure that it makes sense for a bunch of tools that I commonly use. One other thing, I've got this uh, little chunk of plastic which is the end of a silicon tube. Mm -hmm. It makes a beautiful little cup. How did you get all the silicon out of it? Because that is it. like a sticky... Ah. Yeah. No, it was, already, it was already dry. Oh, okay. I was in my rubbish bin. Um, I'm going to use this to put pencils and rulers and little tiny knives in so they don't fall out. I'm going to start screwing that down. What I might do, rather than making the whole thing from scratch, because that looks a little bit ambitious for this evening, and it's hot in here tonight. Somehow. You're wearing like a flannelette shirt. And I suppose that's part of the look, isn't it? You know, flannelette shirt, woodworker. Apron, old guy, yeah? That's how it goes. But that's okay, I can live with that. I made these, they look a bit rough and ready, but they are rather old and they've, they've copped a fair bit of moisture over the years. This is like a pipe rack thing, so just made out of a couple of pieces of MDF. You make it out of hardwood with a slot like so, where part of the pipe clamp goes. You see that stays up there. And Another one like so, which is a round-ended bit. So what effectively you can do, get your pipe clamp and you drop one end in like that, and I just hope it doesn't fall on your noggin, and you can drop the other end in, just balance it most very carefully, like so. And uh, that's, I think one of these is upside down, so the tent is doing that. That one's upside down. This means that you can hang this on the wall. We're actually going to hang it on the back of the uh, of the little cabinet we've made, um, and you can on this one we can hang about six or seven different pipe clamps in a really convenient location. So um, we'll cover that in our next episode of the tiny workshop. Make sure you come back again. The two rules of clamps is that you never have enough, and they're almost always in the way. Well, <laughs> that's the thing. And we were discussing earlier clamps. We've got these little pony clamps. In fact, Timbercon's got a whole stable of ponies out the back there, but 
That's coming soon. What do you think about the clutch? Yeah, oh. look, at first, because I wasn't used to it, I wasn't quite sure of its purpose. And then, when I was setting up for today, I realised that having a clutch means that if you have to preset for a big complicated glue up, mm. they stay exactly where you need them to be. Yeah. So, you have a standard F clamp, you pick them up, that bit falls down. Mm. Once you get used to that, you can use it, but I think the clutch is a really nice addition and once you're used to it, I think it would be tough to go back. I think I, I, think I agree with you because I'm used to a, like a normal style nest clamp where you can slide it. So if you're leaning over here like this to you know, pop a clamp in position, um, these don't do that necessarily. They've got a bit of go in them, I suppose, but you can't release it unless you use the clutch. But if you also, if you're a person who's reasonably new to woodworking, they, the clutch helps you get that grip and then you can tighten. <coughs> some of you, some, I'm amazed how people have trouble, you know, fixing an F-tank because you kind of want to leverage it, yeah? Yep. But the clutch, great innovation. Check this out coming soon to Timbercon. All right, how are you going? Look Good. At that. Okay, so those are my little loop um, it hangers. It definitely is a saddlebag, yeah. Do you have a chisel I can put in there? Oh, hopefully it'll fit, yeah? Thank you, sir. Oh, sweet. Beautiful. Oh, look at this. We've got other stuff, too. So you've got a larger hanger over on the side that you can put your hammer on. Um, all sorts of things. And like I said, little bits and pieces can go in there. How are you going to hang that on the cabinet, though? I've already cut some cleats, mm. so I just take your, take your stuff out of here for a sec. Take your stuff. Uh, I need a Phillips-headed driver. <laughs> really? Yep. No, I don't think we have one. We've only oh, no, I found it. Found it. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to screw the cleats onto the back here, and then we can hang this on the cabinet. While I screw one on here, do you want to screw a corresponding one? Is it going on this end? Oh, whichever end you prefer. Right. What I'll do, apron to the rescue, um, we will... Guess get that dimension right, because you want to set the... Do you want it flush or just below maybe, yeah? Yeah, just below is fine. Oh, shit. It's... I better get my glasses on, Patrick, because I can't see Actually, it. Actually, I'm going to do this from the other side. Yeah. Now, I'm actually going to put this screw in underneath the webbing, so you won't really see it. Excellent. And I'll set the bottom of that down. Let's move that over there. And um, 80 millimeters. So we can. Now, when you are putting a French cleat on something that's light as long as this, you need to put some support on the back side so that it doesn't swing into the cabinet and sit uneven. So that's what this block is for here. Okay. I'm glad when we have a cabinet behind us because I'm sick of looking on the floor to find everything. I know, all my tools right now. I'll measure this one because you can see it. Yeah. Okay. How are you going there? Excellent. Let me just now, would you prefer this on the other side? Oh, I've already marked this out, okay. so let me just pop it on. Yeah. Excellent. Can you just push and stop this rolling away from me? Okay. Hopefully that screw is not too long. Looks a little bit long. Right. Oh. You get the moment? Oh. No, what? Okay, you ready? And there you go. We have 
a little caddy on the side. It's still, but the nice thing is to say you don't need this particular setup. You can put glue in here, you can put a screwdriver set, you can put whatever. If you don't need that particular set, you can store it elsewhere for another time. So that's actually come up pretty good. Well, sorry this took so long tonight. It wasn't that bad. Turns out we just uh, aren't quite as fast as we thought we, we were going to be. It took us 40 minutes last week. It took us 40 minutes this week. Um, we are terribly ambitious, I think, sometimes what we try to create here, but that's okay. Now, next week we're going to talk about a couple of machines that we want to introduce, mostly so we can dimension real timber. And I'm hoping that in, in the future we can have a timber retailer come out and visit us and tell us all about wood. Um, but we better mark out, we had a little competition going last week about who could come up with the best name uh, for the screw and dowel joint. Now, I must say that the turnout was pretty average, so I've chosen Joe Everett, hey Joe, to be the winner. And his suggestions were the S and D joint, very imaginative joke. <laughs> Even better is the SD joint. I don't know even know what that means. There's something you do by the river, I'm not sure. And the SAD joint, S-A-D, SAD joint. So, I don't know, I kind of like the SAD joint, but it actually is quite a very useful and easy to do joint. So, regardless, we're going to send you a $50 gift voucher for your effort. Thank you very much, Joe Everett. Um, now, we haven't announced any prizes this week, have we? We haven't made up a competition. Oh, no. Well, we might... If you can guess the two machines that we're bringing in next week... Whew, we'll and... give you a hundred grand. No, we won't do that. <laughs> <laughs> no, we're going to... If you could... I'll tell you, here's a competition for you. In the words of Chris Schwartz from somewhere in the Midwest, he chose... He recommends two machines for you to use when you're starting up a workshop. Because he's a hand tool guy, but he does have a couple of machines. And I think it's in his Anarchist Notebook. Is it Anarchist Notebook? Yeah. One of his books, the Anarchist Tool Chest, sorry. Notebook, Tool Chest, I can't remember. He mentions two machines. If you can get what those two machines are, we're going to give you a $50 gift voucher. What if okay? too many people say it? First couple people. Well, <laughs> it's the way you say it's the most important thing. But also, a little disclaimer there that um, if I'm completely wrong about what he actually mentioned, it doesn't matter, we can change our minds anyway, <laughs> right? Because they're the rules. This is our short workshop. Uh, right. So, <laughs> thank you very much for joining the show. We'll see you in a week. Don't forget to subscribe, like our page, send us your suggestions, and we will see you soon. Thank you very much. Thanks, guys. <laughs>